Mr. Ben Berry, how are you today? I'm doing well. It's good to see you again, Willie. You too, Ben. Um, over the last few months, you've done a lot. You projected some things that I remember from two or three years ago, shortly after your, before your father passed away. Uh, ben Flaps Berry, but kind of give us an update on what you're doing today. Give a little history and then we can kind sure, of work sure. our way back. Well, as you know, Airship Technologies Group is a design and manufacturing firm. Um, what's unique about our aircraft is we measure our flight endurance based on days, not minutes or hours. So we use clean technology, uh, solar film on the surface of the aircraft, and then also hydrogen fuel cells for nighttime flight. And that allows us to have long flight endurance. Um, what's, uh, what's starting to happen now is we're getting um, a lot of look in terms of the press, the media, uh, around particular contracts for intelligence as a service, uh, precision agriculture, uh, for farming, and also um, uh, military uh, defense. Uh, we just got a contract last week, actually this week, with the uh, state of Oregon, uh, which is dealing with um, emergency response. Uh, think about natural disasters, uh, think about um, things the state would be asking to use these drones, uh, these unmanned aerial vehicles for, uh, but they're outsourcing that service to um, our, our contract. It's a five-year contract, by the way. Uh, we're also working with the U.S. Army uh, on their expeditionary warrior experiments projects, uh, where, we'll, where we'll be delivering uh, uh, two of the V-1 aircraft uh, two of the B-2, which are a little bit larger, and 14 of our micro-intelligence um, drones, which will be launched from the, the palm of your hand. They're very, very small. Mm -hmm. They look just like the V-1 here, uh, but they're only seven inches, seven to nine inches in wingspan. And um, that particular propulsion is different than our multi-rotors that you see here. These are tri-rotor drones. Um, the micro-intelligence, codenamed Stinger, will actually have three ducts, but it has a central impeller that creates super compressed air that comes out of these three rings that propels the aircraft. So we're just very excited about the, uh, being a part of this uh, un un unmanned aerial services business. Um, to date, I think the industry is about $11.4 billion. It's estimated to go to about $94 billion over the next two years why you're carrying on the vision that you have today? Well, we, my father and I actually um, worked on this design for the airship back in 1991 when I worked for Hughes Aircraft Company. And in 91, people weren't thinking about small drones. I mean, a drone was something the Air Force would use for target practice to shoot down a drone, uh, old vintage World War II aircraft. And we always believed that drones could be a lot smaller, they could be vertical takeoff and landing because we knew about the Harrier jump jet. Um, and so we designed that uh, very rudimentary back in 91, did a couple of science and technology presentations, and I promptly put it on the shelf for a few decades because uh, the world hadn't caught up with us yet. Mm -hmm. And about three years ago, uh, someone came to me and said, you know, in the year uh, 2015, the, the FAA is going to open up the national airspace for small unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, that can fly up to 400 feet, uh, having a payload of 55 pounds or less. And they asked me, Ben, don't you have something that will do that? And I said, well, yeah, we've got the airship. So um, I incorporated the firm uh, Airship Technologies Group. Um, we have about 22 people now who are associated with the ship. And we are at the beginning of a industry that is just growing uh, leaps and bounds. Uh, so we're very happy to have made this launch and actually bringing forth an aircraft that is becoming very competitive in this marketplace. My father uh, is a Tuskegee Airman from World War II. Um, in 1943, America needed a lot of pilots. They were losing um, B-17 bombers, I think 50 to 60 bombers per day over Germany. And about 500 to 600 air crews were, were being shot down per day. And they wondered if black people could fly airplanes because they needed more pilots. 
And so the call went out and 10,000 African Americans uh, raised their hand to become uh, candidates for uh, the Army Air Corps, uh, what became the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, they trained these, these people day in and day out. All kinds of tests were given, mental, physical. Um, to take one class in algebra, we took to we take a whole term in college for that. They would have to take the whole book from the beginning to the end and take a test after just one week. And so their goal was really to whittle down the 10,000 uh, to the cream of the crop. Actually, they went down from 10,000 to 1,000, and those became the Tuskegee Airmen of World War II. My dad was one of those people, um, Ben Flapsberry, um, who was a Tuskegee Airmen cadet at the end of the war. And after the war, uh, he went to work uh, in California, where he actually met um, Howard Hughes. Uh, it was funny because Dad would always design these monorail systems. Um, he, he would show these designs to people, and people said, well, you know, you got to take this to uh, this guy who's building this really big airplane, Howard Hughes, because uh, he's, he's an investor in technology. Uh, Dad got in the car to go see Howard Hughes, and of course he got stopped at the gate. And they said, well, do you have an appointment <laughs> to see how it is? And Dad, Dad said, well, no, but I've got the designs. <laughs> and so oh, you have the designs? <laughs> so he got him to actually see Howard Hughes. And Howard was looking at these designs and said, wow, these are pretty impressive. Uh, are you some kind of uh, engineer? And Dad said, well, no, I was a pilot during the war, but I, uh, I would just want to go to a two-year school. And Howard said, well, you know, this is a, a monorail system, and the trains, they have the whole country tied up in dual rails, not monorails, uh, you had to go down to USC and show this to the dean at, at USC, the University of Southern California. And so Dad got back in the car, he gets to the dean's uh, office, he gets stopped by the executive admin. And she says, well, do you have an appointment to see the dean? And Dad says, no, I don't have an appointment, but Howard Hughes sent me down here to see the dean. <laughs> So uh, he gets in to see the dean. The dean's looking at the designs. He's asking, well, are you some kind of engineer because these are really good? Dad said, no, and I'm going to go to a two-year school. And the dean said, no, you shouldn't go to a two-year school. You should go to a four-year school, and you should come here at USC. And Dad said, well, you know, I haven't even applied for your school. He said, that's okay. We're going to let you in anyway. <laughs> So Dad uh, went through the aeronautical engineering program at USC. He was the first African American to graduate in aeronautical engineering at USC. And that allowed him to work in the aerospace industry, Lockheed Martin, Hughes Aircraft, Space Technology Laboratories. And that's where I got my interest and inspiration, which would later lead into a company called Airship Technologies Group. Okay. Just real quick, let's, let's take a peek at um what's on the horizon other than some of the other contracts you talked about um, in a program coming up or a, a trade show coming up called the African Trade uh, Show or yes. Summit? Well, I'm really excited to go to the African Trade Show. I think it's an excellent venue for multiple African nations to do trade and networking with technology and food production companies. Uh, it's going to be at the uh, Sacramento uh, Cow Expo. A uh, very exciting place to be at in Sacramento. Uh, my role, I'll, I'll fly, I think it's the second through the, through the fourth. I'll be there my first day uh, doing a lot of networking. I'm on a panel uh, talking about uh, technology transfer, especially around aerospace and my own, uh, my own company. Um, I think this venue, is, for me personally, allows me to reconnect uh, with the mother country mm -hmm. uh, that, that I've never known because mm -hmm. I've, I've been uh, I'm here, I've never been to Africa. Right. Um, but even my daughter, whom I would love to have, to have come to this, uh, she is in food science and technology at Oregon State University. Um, that's the kind of conference where it allows, it will allow her to uh, understand what the need is um, and what from an African standpoint, but also what uh, the U.S. will be able to supply to Africa. And so I, I think this conference alone is a great networking event to do just that. Trade, sharing of ideas um, around production, around food technology, food and technology. And, and 
including our youth and young adults, African Americans, or people of color specifically. Do you see some of the opportunities in the gaming industry and just some of the other uh, maybe uh, nanotechnology side and uh, even the ag side with uh, meta technology and that in the food industry to introduce our kids to that and bring them into the, uh, the whole conversation? Well, I, I think uh, from our youth standpoint, any way we can excite them, encourage them to take the path of technology, and, and we have a service or a vehicle that does excite them, that, that means a, a avenue into higher paying wages, higher paying jobs of the future. Uh, that's how I got started in technology through my father. Um, and that has paid me dividends to have a family wage job going forward. Uh, there's certain industries that will come along in life that will be mega industries. This is one of those mega industries. Mm -hmm. You think about the advent of computers, desktop computers. I remember when I was in college, uh, we didn't have desktop computers. We had the mainframe. And so I was making a decision um, and making a bet on, on my career. Should I go into technology computers? Uh, because it looked like that could pay dividends in the future. It's the same thing that's happening in the year 2016. For uh, people of color today to think about what they want to be doing 10, 15, 20 years from now, it really, they should really be thinking about what am I going to bet on for a career that's going to allow me to have a family wage job in the future. And so that's the same thing we're having now with unmanned systems. We're having unmanned systems not only with aerial aircraft, but unmanned systems with driverless cars. So now you witness the Google car. Well, that's an unmanned system True. that does not require a driver. I never thought about that until you said it. Oh, yeah. yeah so these unmanned systems will, are going to proliferate um, into the future as society begins to adopt them. And they've already adopted the, un the unmanned driverless car in California. Mm -hmm. And where California goes, so does the rest of the country. Right. Uh, we've already adopted unmanned systems aerially across the world. And that a lot of dollars are being poured into those kind of aerial platforms from an R&D standpoint, from a services standpoint, and now a commercialized standpoint. So yeah, I, I think um, if you can see a technology that's going to grow in the future, um, that's the kind of thing you want to latch on to, and this is one of them, unmanned systems. Okay, in closing, any words you want to give? Um, well, in closing, um, I'm just, I, I love running Airship Technologies Group because it's all about uh, reinvention, but also invention, um, and, and driving home the passions that, I, that I've acquired over the years. Well, definitely, we appreciate over the years, and it's been a little close to four years now, I believe. Um, the first few with your dad, who is, was and is uh, uh, inspiration for us, but also you're the next generation to uh, introducing us to what he has given you. And after this interview in the near future, we want to talk about how long it took you to even know the history of who your dad was and what he oh, yes. contributed and gave to the nation and, and, and the world. Very much so. Well, I appreciate the discussion this morning, Billy. Thank you, Ben. Thanks for taking time. Sure. If this world were mine, Don't ever let people tell you you can't do something. I designed this aircraft was on the back of a napkin back in 1991. And it looks very similar to what you see today. If you have a great idea, uh, get people around you, explore that idea, uh, begin to build a prototype, and then begin to work your prototype, and then talk about your invention to others so that you can bring it to actual fruition and produce something. When you think about the unmanned systems business, it's not just the aerial flight of a drone, it's the kinds of technologies that one wants to become involved in so they're most effective in careers with this kind of aircraft. If you look at the entire airframe, uh, this is a 3D printed airframe. 
So we use 3D printers to print the entire airframe as a complete um, uh, fuselage and, 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 and uh, airframe. In fact, when we 3D print it, it's printed vertically. So it starts at the bottom with the printer, just like a piece of paper, and it starts printing all the way up until it gets to the nose. Uh, and then there's individual parts that get printed separately. So this particular uh, ducted tilt rotor in the back is printed separately. Um, we have the canopy that's printed separately. There is a belly hatch on the back that is also printed separately. And so 3D printing is really a next step in technology for not just aircraft, but for a number of different industries. Uh, you'll see 3D printing in medical, where they're beginning to 3D print uh, uh, particular components of the body, uh, bones, for example. Uh, there's some lungs being tested for 3D printing materials. So you can have hard materials that are printed, but also flexible and soft materials that are printed. So I think that's one area of, of concentration. The other area is uh, communications. So when we're flying this drone, uh, there's a number of ways that someone with a handheld radio can use line of sight to see the drone flying. Uh, that's a radio communications technology. Uh, just so happens we're working with Georgia Tech Research Institute to make our canopy a smart canopy, which will have about seven different radio frequencies um, that are built into a 3D printed canopy. So that canopy will, is very lightweight compared to the other kinds of uh, components we would have to buy, um, and doesn't take as much power. So that smart canopy will be good for line of sight, um, control of the drone, but also beyond line of sight, looking at controlling it via satellite. Uh, we also can com control the drone based on cellular communications. So that's another technology, um, whereby just like your cell phone, that connects to a cell tower, we'll be able to control these through cell towers and smartphones. Uh, if you look at our uh, micro aerial vehicle, it's only seven inches versus 2.4 feet. That one will have a Google Glass interface with a little heads up display, so it'll carry a camera in the nose of the drone, um, so the operator will be able to see what the drone sees in the heads up display, and then we're gonna be using voice navigation to actually direct the drone as to where to go. Uh, another technology is Intel's uh, Real Sense for Drones, which is collision avoidance. Uh, collision avoidance will have two cameras mounted on the wings. Um, that, those will be the eyes of the collision avoidance system. So think about a forest, being able to fly through a forest. Uh, those cameras paint the imagery of what's in front of the drone. And for near objects, the drone will know to avoid those, those, drone, those particular objects and continuing flying from point A to point B. So when I look at this technology, it's really a combination of several different technologies all coming together that make this aircraft a valuable asset uh, as, a, uh, as a customer or an individual who wants to fly. So for the Future Development Youth Center, this is a shout out. You guys are doing a great job. Don't stop now. I'm looking forward to your success.